What's going on, everybody? I'm super excited to be able to bring back the Penultimate Podcast. It's been a minute, but we've been here. Um, and today we have the privilege of jumping into a conversation with Jonathan Clark, aka Jay Clark, the jumper, friend of mine, super athlete. He's a pro dunker. He's a former D1 track and field athlete. And we're going to be diving into the elite mindset. What does it take to set yourself apart from the rest of the crowd, you know, bigger than the training aspect. What are the traits that really make up an elite athlete? John's going to share, um, you know, part of his story. So we have context to who he is, and then we're really going to dive in and I'm going to pick his brain to find out what those key factors are. So don't go anywhere the ultimate podcast is powered by project pure athlete visit projectpureathlete.com and check out the complete line of ppa training and technique products all products are created by the jump guy and have been used and endorsed by coaches and athletes worldwide jump higher train smarter you are now listening to the penultimate podcast with the jump guy tyler ray powered by project pure athlete Jump higher, train smarter. All right, what's going on, man? Uh, John Clark here in the house. This has been a long time coming. He is sitting right inside what looks like his trophy room right now. <laughs> and I wanted to take this opportunity after many requests from the PPA community to talk to you to bring back the penultimate podcast and kind of piggyback this um, athlete ambassador joining that you've done to team PPA and dive into the concept of the elite mindset because we have in front of us right now one of the most elite athletes I've ever had the privilege of knowing and talking to so this is going to be a treat. Uh, John before we dive into the elite mindset stuff let's do a quick Coles Notes version of who John Clark is, how you ended up where you're at, and then we'll dive into the meat and potatoes. Got you. Okay. Um, so what's going on, everybody? My name is Jonathan Clark. I am originally from Los Angeles, California. I currently live in Fresno, California. A little about myself. Um, I grew up loving basketball. Um, my mom played basketball in college. My uncle was a basketball coach. Basketball was in my DNA. Like everybody else, I had that dream of being a professional basketball player, hitting that game-winning shot at the championship, winning my sixth, shaking my fist, all that good <laughs> stuff. Um, and that dream ultimately came to a halt my freshman year. I was a late bloomer. I came into high school 5'4", 99 pounds. Very tiny. Um, so I got cut. I got cut from the basketball team. And, you know, everybody was like, oh, it's okay. Michael Jordan got cut. Work hard do all the right things and you'll make the team the next year. I, you know, worked as hard as I could day and night. I practiced in the rain. I ate my fruits and vegetables. You know, I did everything that I could. And, you know, during that tryout again, I came, came around and I got cut again. And at that point it was kind of, you know, you know, almost a deal breaker. Well, basketball is not going to be in my future and at the time I was doing track and field and the ultimate goal of track and field was to stay in shape for basketball and get my body ready for basketball so after I got cut the second time I was like you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna show them uh you know I'm gonna put all my efforts in track and field and I'm gonna get really good at this thing and ultimately I did I started to get really good with with the high jump and triple jump and uh, I went on to be a state champion I got a scholarship to UCLA um, I was a two-time All-American at UCLA, and I competed in the 2012 Olympic Trials and the Triple Jump. And once again, I was kind of, you know, going down that path, and that kind of changed my goals a little bit. And at the time, I was like, you know what, I'm going to be an Olympian. Uh, you know, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to enjoy this this lifestyle of, you know, getting paid to play sports. And still, you know, it's it's not what I wanted initially, but it's still kind of along the same lines. And um, that dream came to a halt in 2012 when I did not make the Olympic team and I kind of didn't really get a lot of offers in terms of overseas opportunities. So at the time I was like, you know what, I'm done with sports. I'm just going to kind of get a nine to five and I was working. Um, and there was just this big hole missing in my life. So I kind of decided to start playing basketball again, you know, just pick it up, having fun with it. So we're playing basketball and I was a jumper um, at the time, you know, people call me Jay Clark, the jumper, not because of 
you know, the slam dunks, it was because of triple jump and high jump. Um, and so in the games, I would do dunks. After games, I would do dunks. And I started posting it to Instagram. And people started following. People started noticing. And I, I ultimately kind of got pushed into this world um, of dunk, this dunk community I did not know existed. I did not know had been around. And, you know, seeing, seeing all these guys doing this, you know, traveling the world, competing in contests. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is exactly what I was searching for. And kind of, you know, I devoted myself to that. Uh, I was probably, I think, 23, 24 uh, when I first started in one. And just kind of really, uh, my adult life has been dedicated on, you know, developing this skill of, you know, traveling, competing in dunk contests and, you know, pushing the pace on, on new dunks. What I love about track and field is, you know, you're pushing your body to the ultimate and what I love about the dunking is now you get to be creative with it and you get to come up with new things and um, invent, if you will, um, uh, you know, a form of expression on top of the, the, uh, the, the physical. I, I know, Tyler, you talk a lot about the, the science and the art of jumping. And I think dunking is that, that perfect mix because you have the science of like pushing your body to jump as hard and as high as you can. And you know, the art of getting really crafty with it and making it beautiful and uh, aesthetically pleasing. Absolutely, absolutely. Not many people know this, well, I guess more so now, but within the outside of the world of dunking, what do you do alongside being oh, I, a professional wow. dunker? Man, I completely, but I butchered that. Uh, yes, yeah, so during, during this whole... Uh, this, this whole, I guess, journey of me as a dunker, um, I, uh, within that story, I, I was able to, you know, travel the world. I've, I've been able to do a lot of amazing things. One of the things that I did was I, I played basketball with the Harlem Globetrotters and I got to travel uh, with them. And um, after, after the season kind of came to a halt and I was kind of transitioning more into my life of becoming an adult, getting married and wanting to settle down, I, uh, ultimately uh, parted ways with the Globetrotters and I was kind of at a crossroads of like, what do I do now? So I ended up going back to school to get my master's degree uh, in kinesiology. I wanted to coach uh, track and field, I, I thought at least at the time. And to pay for, for grad school, I started substitute teaching. And the second I like stepped into a classroom, I knew my calling was teaching. So I ended up going back to school after I got my master's degree to get my teaching credential. And for the past four years now, I've been um, an eighth grade science teacher and a track coach um, at a local high school or local middle school, I should say, um, transitioning into a high school this year um, where I'm going to be teaching PE and coaching track and field. Fellow educator, that I we couldn't leave that part out because that part uh, rings so so close to yeah. home as I was a teacher as well uh, before yeah. I dove in full time with with Project Pure Athlete. But um, what a story! And I think the entire story is really wrapped in the concept of being able to hold strong to an end goal, and in spite of obstacles that have arisen along the way, you found yourself here in a phenomenally influential place for athletes all over the world so uh you know first and foremost congratulations but of uh, being able to push through that and really get to this point because you're doing wonderful things and and i think you need to hear that more often um so hey, no, no problem no problem uh so the elite mindset john this is this is one that you know we get a lot of questions uh, at ppa you get a lot of questions through your uh through your social media platforms and like how do I jump higher? How do I become a better athlete? And yeah. it's usually like, what training program should I be doing? Right. I think that's like the, you know, should I be lip, doing squats or should I be doing plyometrics? And what's the set think, rep range. Right. <laughs> what's the set rep range? What are, you know, what are you doing? And I think before that question is answered, the unpopular answer for that is what's your mindset? Are you, <laughs> Is this something that you are wishing or is this something that you're actually going to put stock in to be able to progress forward and really check some boxes along the way? And that's something that I really, um, as, a, as a coach, hold near and dear to my heart. And I know you as an athlete and obviously an educator hold near and dear to your heart. So this is, you're a perfect person to be able to dive into this topic with. I've 
put together a list on my end of five pillars criteria that I feel um, really represent the elite mindset. And I'd love to get your thoughts and yep. kind of find out how to bridge your experiences into these actual pillars. So why don't we dive into the first one right away? Let's do it. The concept of persistence as an, as an athlete. I think this is okay. one that can, it cannot be denied, but no. your journey, you just talked about having to persist through and, and really stay true to that journey. When you hear persistence, John, like what are your initial thoughts? Um, it, well, a lot of times when I think about persistence, I, I have this image in my head and it, it was an image that, that always circulates around on Instagram and on Facebook. It's, uh, it's two guys that are, you know, like they're, almost coal miners, if you will. And they're like digging, they're digging through the dirt. And one of the guys uh, in the image is walking away. And he's literally, I would say, probably an inch, maybe even less than an inch away from, if he continues to dig, he's right at the diamond. And he's kind of like walking away from that, from that goal. And the other guy, he's a little bit further away, but it looks like he's not going to stop. And um, that persistence is really just kind of, it's pushing through those difficult times. You don't know when it's going to happen, um, but you have to kind of just continue, um, continue your course of action despite all difficulties. Like things, things aren't always going to go your way. I um, wasn't, uh, you know, offered the contract that I wanted with the Globe Trotters. Ultimately, that's why we, we kind of parted ways. Um, I. Uh, tore my ACL. I tore my meniscus after tearing my ACL. You know, these there, there's all these these setbacks that happen um, in my career when and people look at the end result and it's like, man, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. This is so cool. But there's been you know turn after turn after turn where it could have like I could have given up and just walked away and and uh, that would have been it. So it's like really just you know being determined to not let any obstacles kind of get in the way of what, what you feel you can do. I think there's, those are amazing points. And I love that visual of the coal miners and digging and, and walking away and really not knowing, right. That's that hindsight perspective. That I think a lot of people have the, I think one of the biggest things, and you mentioned that briefly was that people look and, and they see the end result right? They see the, they see the medals, they see the, the money, they see the, the, the views, they see the dunks and it looks easy. And I used to get yeah. this as well, you know, when I was in the dunk world and the track world as a, as a, as a good athlete, people look at you and they see what you do and you make it look easy. So they assume that it came easy. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they don't see the work that goes in behind the scenes. And I think as a, as an athlete coming up, what you can what you can really learn from the uh, concept of persistence is that there are so many pieces along the way. Like I always equate everything to a puzzle. When people ask me, like, you know, if I can give any advice to any athletes, it's it's normally in the in the perspective of of persistence, and it's that our athletic career is a journey of acquiring very very small pieces to an exceptionally large puzzle. I like that you know what I'm saying? Like we're not, it's not about finding a key to success or a magic pill or a secret this. It's really, you're just every single day finding another small piece. And the more persistent you are with day-to-day -day work and, and day-to-day -day self care, the more likely you are to find that piece. And the quicker that image becomes visible to you. Yeah. And that's, that's that, that's the visual that I've always had. And, and I'm, and I'm, sure that's something that rings true with you as well. Definitely. Definitely. I agree. Absolutely. So persistence is an exceptionally important part. And I think that, again, I will always answer questions, honestly, from a, from a coach's and an athlete's perspective. When someone comes to me and says, what can you help me get from point A to point B? I will say, yes, I can. But are you ready and willing to go through what it actually takes? Because I think a lot of people don't realize that oh, so you don't see the stuff that really goes on underneath the surface. I think one thing that, that I always tell my track athletes is I use the, the analogy of a switch in terms of what it takes to get to a certain level. For me, uh, becoming a state champion was – 
I remember the day. My junior year, I was um, competing in our kind of our, our sectional championship. And I had a teammate who was uh, a senior as well. And at the time, I was better than him. I was a school record holder. Um, and on that day, he, he beat me. And it, I, I was bumped out um, to, to go on to the state championship. And he broke my school record in doing it. Um, so kind of like watching the rest of the season unfold was like a knife um mm -hmm. just in my heart and and you know no fault to him like I, I wasn't mad at him because like we're athletes we compete um but kind of watching it was like one of those things that was like devastating it's like wow like this happened to me and I remember the I went to the state meet and I watched it um and he did he did amazing and you know he went on to graduate I remember calling my mom that day I was like I'm gonna win state I'm gonna take back my school record and it, it was like flipping a switch and I never turned that switch off again. So it was like, wait, when I woke up in the morning, that was the mindset, like, I'm gonna win state. So I woke up in the morning, I was in the pool, I was working out, my mindset was winning state. I was in school, in my mind, yes, I'm going to class, so I don't uh, do poorly, so I can win state. Going to track practice, I was doing this to win, everything I did became about this goal. And um, it wasn't, act, there was nothing magical, special, anything that I did that was different than what anybody else could have done. It was just in my mind, like this needed to be done because this is what it took to do it. And I took that, you know, from workout to workout, to workout, to workout. And the mindset was just like, this is what I'm doing. And like had a headache, was sore, was tired, didn't matter. It was like, this is what I'm doing because this is what I have to do. And, and I even take that now, like in my mindset of my training today, it's like, I want to do the 360 double between the legs. I'm pushing through this workout. I'm pushing through this. I'm going to do extra abs after, you know, my PPA training. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, stretch a little bit more because I need to, you know, it's the little things that make that big difference. And I, I'm not going to like, oh, I'm tired. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to drink my water. I'm going to, you know, eat the right things because I have a goal and, and, and nothing's going to get in the way of, of achieving that goal. That absolutely, you know, you touched briefly on, you know, you tore your ACL, you tore your meniscus. Injuries, I think, are something that really fall into this concept of persistence because as a, an athlete, injuries are not a case of if, they're really a case of when. You know what I mean? Like you, you are, if you are competing or trying to compete at a high level or trying to push yourself at a high level, you will find that threshold. And yes. As the elite mindset, you do need to be able to push through the, what are some of the things that went through your mind initially when you first, when you injured your ACL that first time, what are some of the things that kind of came on um, uh, as that injury occurred? Um, especially in the dunk community, when I initially got the, you know, diagnosis of torn ACL, my initial thought was, you know, game over. It was like, You've never heard of a pro dunker, you know, with a torn ACL. That's a, you know, your, your, your livelihood is based off of jumping and landing. Um, ACL is kind of needed for that. Um, especially if you're going to be doing, you know, the more elite dunks, you kind of, you kind of need that ability and, and, you know, seeing guys, you've seen it in the NBA when some guys, you know, tear their ACL, they, they could have been, you know, on that path of greatness. And then like all of, all of a sudden it just stops because, you know, it's, it is, it is really one of those, those kind of career ending injuries. And th that was the initial thought. I was like, man, this is over. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, but ultimately I like how you say like the, the pieces, the day to day, I kind of really took it to as a day to day thing where I was like, all right, don't worry about, don't worry about, you know, playing you know being able to play for the for the globe trotters because at the time that was kind of when it was happening i i um had made the team uh well i uh, tried out i tore my acl and the next day i got a phone call telling me i made the team and this is when training camp would start sure. and i had to tell them i tore my acl and they were like all right get healthy and once you get healthy you can come back um so i was like when i started training again and kind of like doing rehab after surgery it was like you know, don't worry about the Globetrotters right now. Worry about um, 
you have 140 degree uh, flexion in the knee. Let's right. let's push let's push that to 142 tomorrow. Let's um, you can only do 10 reps. Uh, you know, lay, uh, leg extension before it starts to hurt. Let's push it to 12. And every day it was kind of like little things, little goals, and just making sure like having timer set on my phone, like, all right, you know, you need to ice now. This is ice time. This is drinking water time. This is, and just really took it, you know, I took it moment by moment. And, you know, because I was so involved in the process, like over time, I didn't, I didn't really notice you know, how fast I was recovering because I was so focused on doing what needed to be done at that, you know, exact moment. Right. Um, and really just like persisting, like every day was a little battle and you just, you just have to come in every day and just, just attack it. There was, there were times where I'm like, I almost broke. I remember I was sitting in uh, physical therapy and they had like different little sections of rooms and, and like in the middle of a workout, I just had to dip off to the side, you know, put my head down, you know, shed a couple of tears. And like, they came in and saw like, are you okay? I was like, you know, I'm gonna be fine. I just, I just need to get through this. And sure. like really came back and kind of, um, you know, it's like, like looking at those moments now, it's, it's, I'm like, I'm so grateful that I, that I persisted through it because it makes, you know, what I do now so much sweeter. Even when I have like, terrible dunk sessions like the other day where I, I made maybe six dunks out of, you know, all the dunks that I tried. Right. It's like, you know, you look back and it's like, you know, I remember when it was then, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's having that, that perspective of, of kind of what, what would have, could have, should have, and like, you know, not, not dealing with that, just focusing on the now and, and, and doing what you need to do to kind of persist through. Right. I think that's like a, perfect segue as well I mean, you, you, you mentioned the concept of perspective and as you were talking about this you know the the whole uh you know i'm going to focus on the number of reps i have i'm going to focus on being able to extend and you know flex my knee a little bit further every single time and what that allowed you to accomplish was great i mean obviously you've been able to come back from from a, an injury that many people um you know like you mentioned is career ending so that perspective concept and quality, I think, is something that you carried through, whether subconsciously or consciously, the entire yeah. time. And a lot of people can learn from that in the sense that as John was progressing through those moments of, you know, uh, tribulation and, and having moments of shedding a tear, it, it, you know, feel, you know, you feel bad, you feel it's hard, it's, you're, you know, you're, you're trudging through the mud. But yeah. every single moment like that is another one of those little small puzzle pieces. And you're, and you're just putting it in your puzzle and you're saying, no, these are, these are making me stronger. These are crafting my image. These are crafting my end result. So yeah. it, the, the concept of perspective is one that it is, you know, woven into the fabric of what I teach. Um, can you think of any other instances where, you know, having perspective, um, you know, being able to, from the outside, look in and uh, keep a logical mind about situations, something that rings true with you that you can share with the people out there. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, and, and I have kind of, you know, I feel like we, we uh, resonate on a lot of different levels with kind of how we attack things. And I think for me, when I, when I look at perspective, a lot of times I, I have to look at myself as, you know, an entity. I have to look at, especially if you're an athlete, um, it, is, it is really difficult to kind of persist through things without having that perspective. Because it, like if, you, if you personalize and internalize a lot of things, for me, it just does not work well. I think I have to kind of almost get outside of my body, even, even like when I'm like, so like when I run, um, I hate running. Um, I run, tr I was a track and field As athlete. Many I good track and field athletes do. Yeah. <laughs> I was a jumper. I, I hate running, but when I run, I almost have to kind of get out of body when I run. And like, it's not about, you know, Jonathan is tired. It's about you know, Jonathan has to look at himself as like a vehicle or something. You, you kind of, you know, almost externalize yourself as something else. And it's like, all right, lift your knees, lift your knees, lift your knees. And that's kind of what the focus becomes. So it's like, you know, when I'm lifting heavy weight, it's not, 
oh, this is so heavy. It's like drive, 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 drive. And I'm like telling myself these things. And um, so from a, from a day-to-day aspect, it's kind of like externalizing myself as like, I like to think of it as a vehicle um, because I think, you know, jumping and uh, rocket ships or cars kind of have a lot of, you know, qualities that are very similar. Like you need to be very light, but strong. Um, you need to put your, put the right fuel. You need to take care of all the little parts because if the little parts fail, then the big parts are going to f- fail. Um, so in terms of training, I, I do it from a day to day like that. And then big picture, like I said, it's like that vehicle, like how, how am I maintaining that vehicle over a long period of time? And, and that perspective in a, in a sense, as weird as it sounds, makes me, you know, it allows me to place more value on you know, how I approach my training. So it's like, I'm not taking care of, you know, Jonathan Clark, the person, you know, I'm taking care of, you know, if you will, Jay Clark, the jumper, the body, because Jay Clark, the jumper, the body is the one that is doing the dunking and stuff like that. And I know it's like, for young athletes, um, this was one that was easy for me, like, food became fuel. It wasn't like, I didn't eat food because it tastes good. I didn't eat this because I I wanted it. It's like, I need to fuel my body the right way to, to perform the right way. So, you know, I had to cut X, Y, and Z out. And it's easy to just cut those things out because now it's like, I'm, I'm feeding the machine rather than, you know, feeding myself or just kind of like how I approach, you know, you know, do I want to stay up late with my friends? No. Cause the, you know, I want to stay up late and have fun with my friends, but my body needs to sleep. My body needs this. And just kind of having that, um, that, that that's the perspective, I guess, that I, I take into it. Um, it's, it's almost like externalizing it. So it's, you know, easier to make those decisions rather than, um, you know, making it a personal decision. So it's not an attack on, my body that I'm drinking this water that I don't want to drink anymore. It's I'm fueling the body that needs the the water to perform the way it needs to perform. I'm giving myself this exercise. I don't want to, I don't want to run. I don't want to, you know, like, especially when I, during parts of the season when I'm, you know, particularly, you know, a couple pounds uh, overweight. Um, and I don't mean overweight as in like, you know, just, just, right. you know, uh, as a jumper, fat doesn't fly, uh, something that uh, my college coach said, um, and, and it stuck with me. So it's like, if I, if I know I perform optimally at 183 and I'm 187, I know I need to get a, you know, I need to burn more calories. So it's like, I don't want to run. I hate running. I've said that <laughs> a couple times already. But Wait, do, like, you hate, do you hate running? I hate running. <laughs> but it's like, so it's like, it's like, you know, doing the things, it's it, that perspective, um, by externalizing it, for me at least, it's like I'm able to do the things that I don't want to do because I know I need them, and that's what's going to help me persist, and that's what's going to keep adding those those pieces to the puzzle. Yeah, I love that, um, again, that visual of, of the entity and, and separating, you know, the, the self from the competitor because at the end of the day, although you make up – one in the same, you want different things from each one. And it requires that perspective. Like that's, that's such a wonderful visual to have. Now, how about in, you know, when I hear perspective, my mind goes to the process. So something, something like, something like jump training in general, right? So I get a, you know, I get a message from, um, you know, Joe Blow from overseas. And he says to me, um, I want to, I want to start training. What program should I get? And how long will it take for me to, to jump 10 inches higher? Right. Which is like classic yeah. thing or like how many inches will I gain on your programs? Yeah. And my response is always, you know, I, I think what I would recommend is let's not start the journey like this. Let's not start the journey with setting an expectation for what yeah. your success looks like. Uh, let's just get working because in my mind as, as a, you know, a former elite athlete, um, you know, I remember and recognize that it took, it didn't take three months. It didn't take six months. It took my whole life to that point to be at that point. So, for, yeah. right. So for, pers- for perspective for me is always, 
understanding that it's a process that requires an immense amount of passion as fuel. Uh, because if you don't have yeah. that passion, you're not going to be able to persist. And that's yeah. the one you know, statement that I always make is that the best athletes in the world are the ones that are the most obsessed with the process of progress mm -hmm. of progression. So anything, anything worth having, um, is going to take some time. And you know, if it, if it doesn't take time, honestly, it's not worth having. So like, that you know that vertical leap program that you know you gain 14 inches in two weeks if let's say it does you know pr deliver on its promise that's not that's you know it's not gonna last mm -hmm. um and for that for that program that you've put six years into that you know that's more likely to stick because you you have invested all that time blood sweat tears energy money whatever you invested to, to get that to happen, it, it's going to last longer than, um, and, and it's, it's, it's common, I think, in the vertical leap community because of, you know, these, these shysty market marketing schemes of like, oh yeah, you can double your vertical leap or look at this guy. He, he's throwing down windmills all of a sudden. He, he just signed up for, you know, our program and stuff like that. And it's, that's not, that's not real, you know, that's, I think people need to understand the, the, the truth behind, behind vertical leap training is it's not, it doesn't work like that. I've, you know, been Jay Clark, the jumper since 2007. I've been jump training. Probably I started jump training four or five years before that. So you're looking at, um, you know, 15 plus years of, of training to get to where I'm at. So you're not going to, you know, log into a website, type your name in, download an app, and after two weeks, jump as high as me. It's just not, it's not going to work that way um, because I've, I've dedicated and devoted a lot of my time right. into this. And, and I talked about the thing, the little things that I do day in and day out. And it's like, you need to focus on that stuff if you want to get to that level and not focus on like oh you know more specifically a set rep range to um jump high there is no there is no magical program there's there's a handful of programs out there that you know more or less everyone's talking about you know doing the right things and, and building building the right way um but even then like there are so many more you know, like shady programs that are gonna promise you you know, if you do these workouts in this order, then you're going to jump high. And it's, it's just, unfortunately, that's not how it works. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think we could have probably like three or four offshoot podcasts about topics easy, like this. You know what I mean? Easy, like easy, easy. We dive down this rabbit hole. And I mean, we've done it in person and I'm sure we will continue yes. to do that. I mean, when we can see each other in person, which I'm not sure when that is, but uh, <laughs> it's, it really is a matter of, are you fueled by the right fire and and that really has to be an absolute true passion um like you're saying it was 15 plus years i can remember that i've literally since i can remember i've been obsessed with wanting to jump higher and you take every opportunity you can to jump higher and sometimes you do jump higher but like you know a lot of people don't realize that when you put in work and this comes down to the, uh, the, the next point, which is this concept of vulnerability is putting in the work, the real work sometimes exposes areas of yourself as an athlete that are scary. They're, they're weaknesses, right? And I think elite athletes, and I remember doing this is you, you have to embrace the weaknesses not push them aside. You have to be willing to be vulnerable in order to make yeah. progress. What are your thoughts on the concept of, of being vulnerable? Like, you know, do you, can you remember any distinct moments where like, I mean, you obviously told the story about, you know, being a, um, you know, with your ACL and, and going through the rehab and having a m real emotional moment and sharing, like there's many yeah. factors of, of vulnerability. What do you, you know, expand on that for us? Definitely. So I, I think vulnerability initially started for me growing up watching Michael Jordan, I remember there was an article, it might have been Sports Illustrated or something like that. And one thing that Michael Jordan would do was Michael Jordan, after the season was over, was look at where he struggled in that season uh, at his weaknesses. And all summer long, he would work on those weaknesses 
So when he started the next season, it was one of his strengths. And I know Kobe Bryant was kind of the same way. And it's like, you look at these great athletes that worked on the things they sucked at. And, and a lot of times I, I think like when I go to the, you know, my commercial gym, I go in there and I see a lot of the guys do things that they are really good at because, you know, you're, you're in front of a lot of people, you're in the public and you want to look good. So it's like a lot of guys go to the bench press and it's like, I can lift a lot in the bench press. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do bench presses because it looks good. My arms are getting bigger, like feel you know, good. Yeah. Feel good. And it's like, for me, um, I guess one of, one of my blessings, uh, one of my, my um, idiosyncrasies, if you will, is I, I was always a quirky kid and I didn't really care what people thought about myself. I was just, you know, me and I was unapologetically me. So if I, you know, if I'm making mistakes, I'm okay with making mistakes. If I look goofy, I'm okay with looking goofy. So like when I go to the gym, a lot of times I attack the things that, you know, I suck at. Uh, so like at one point they, we look, we look now, you know, to the more towards in the end result, like I'm, I'm pretty strong and I can lift a lot of weight, but at a time I was, you know, scrawny kid, I was weak, but I worked on those things. So like I worked on, you know, front squats, they feel uncomfortable. I hate them. You know, when I first started doing them because and I don't like, I don't like sitting like this and you know, the bar is, you know feels really uncomfortable. So it's like you work at the things that you suck at. And, and I would constantly just work on the things that I am not good at. And over time, I notice I get more gain ultimately in the long run of what I want to do when I work at the things that I suck at versus going in there and being comfortable and doing the things that I like. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's the, the adage, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable it rings so true um, with athletes, because if you're not, if you're not being uncomfortable, you're not, you're not growing, you're not pushing yourself. There's, there's no, there's no push for change training. All training is is stress. You're, you're stressing the body to, to force it to do something different. Um, and if you don't, if you don't add that stress, there is no change. So, um, it, un, unless you're in a maintenance phase where you're trying to just keep everything the same and, and you love where you're at and you don't want to go anywhere else, um, you need to go to the gym and you need to be uncomfortable. You need to, you know, when you're, when you're going to the field and working on your plot, you need to work on the thing. Like if your single leg balance is off, like that needs to be a focus. If your core stability is trash, you need to, you know, make sure that that that's what you're focusing on to grow because a lot of times, it's easy to catch athletes doing what they're comfortable with because you want to just, you want to look good and you want to, you don't want to be embarrassed, but it's like, you have to put yourself in that vulnerable position because that, that vulnerability, that stress is going to lead to growth in the long term. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great example. And it's something as you're talking, right? Like so many situations are rolling through my head of interactions I've had. And even at moments, like, you know, I'm guilty of it as well at times where, you know, you, I was a, a fairly, I would say, quote unquote, natural jumper before yeah. I started training in the gym, I could jump fairly high. And I remember when I first started um, at a uh, university on, on the track team, at that point, I really hadn't done a lot of weightlifting. I hadn't done a lot of work in the gym. I, I got, a, you know, got by on my natural ability. And I can remember days in the gym where, you know, I love to deadlift. I love to clean. I love, but I didn't want to squat. I didn't want to do the things that felt uncomfortable for me. And it wasn't until I took that pill and, and swallowed the hard pill that I realized that I was really lacking in a whole bunch of areas and I was able to take my vertical from that kind of high thirties into the mid and high forties. And that was all of a sudden now I'm separated because I separated my mindset. It wasn't that I necessarily had to separate the physical is I had to get past that mental block of not needing change. And I, I segue with this story. I, tr I try to really provide a lot of great segues here, John. Uh, but I segue to the concept of humility, which is really what I think a lot of people need to experience, especially in our social media heavy driven world right now, where, wow. like you're saying, nobody wants to look weak. Nobody wants to admit that they maybe don't have it all figured out. Uh, and maybe a lot of people want things kind of handed to them right now. So, um, Let's talk humility. Let's talk, um, you know, staying true to that process when it comes to 
how you perceive yourself uh, making those athletic progressions. When I say humility, John, like what do you think as an athlete in your mindset? Um, so humility for me, it, it's kind of twofold and it's kind of a very, in a sense, it's a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation. So in my head, when I approach things, I have to have the utmost confidence in myself. Um, I have to believe I can do anything I set my mind to. I have to believe I am more than capable of doing the things that I go out and you know, shoot to, to strive for, right? And, and if you were able to kind of you know, get inside my mind and, and, and see where I'm at in terms of that, that confidence, it flirts on the line of cocky. Um, I, I, and I will say that I will 100% be honest and say like, in my head, like you cannot tell me I'm, I'm not the best when I'm pursuing the things that I want to pursue. Um, and you know, on the outside, I have to kind of, you know, fight that. It's almost like, you know, the angel and demon type situation on, on the shoulders with like, you're not there yet. Because if I, if I were to give in to this, 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 this confident, side, I would not be able to grow. I would not be able to get to where I need to. So it's almost, it's like placing that chip on your shoulder and always putting some sort of chip or something to dangle and the, you know, the dangling the carrot in front of you to kind of keep pushing and growing. So it's like, um, I, I'm never going to, I'm never, you're not going to see this, this cocky side, but in terms of the dealing with that within the social media realm, it, it becomes even more cluttered and I think just for me being able to realistically look at you know and analyze myself as a person if, if I'm competing for a contest let's say we'll, we'll, we'll kind of you know quantify it in a dunk contest I, I have to be able to look at myself and like look at where you're at look at you almost it's almost like you know stepping outside your body again because you know you're you know what you're capable of doing but you also have to look at your competition around there are some talented dunkers there's some talented jumpers and you know where do you fit in within that realm? And if you're not where you need to be, you need to kind of, you know, get back in, you know, the hyperbolic time chamber, if you will, and kind of put in the work that, that you need to, to get to where you need to go. Um, like, so when you, when you put all that together, I would say like, yes, you, you, there has to be some sort of confidence in there. You have to kind of believe in yourself, but like, I, I'm not the, the, ultra braggadocious outward type and i think i think as athletes you have to find your personality which whatever works for you works for you I, I, there is no one size fits all in terms of you know personality trait muhammad ali who i regard as one of the greatest athletes ever um was that you know outwardly confident but when he trained he definitely had that chip on his shoulder he wasn't like um you know, oh, I don't need to train because I'm not the greatest. It was like, I'm the greatest, but he was able to back that up. So I think um, find your personality, but just understand you're going to have to battle with, you know, th this idea of confidence, but at the same time, you can't just give in to that confidence. You're going to always have to work. It, there, I think uh, athletics, a lot of times people are so goal focused and they, they realize it, that they're trying to reach a certain goal, but it's not about the goal. It's, it's, you know, it's the process and you have to really fall in love with that process. And that process is going to lead you to different destinations, if you will. Absolutely. That's really well said, man. You know, it's, and I love how you said you have to find yourself and you have to find out like who that person is in that process, right? Being fueled by, confidence and being and having that I was the same way listen in my mind I was <laughs> I was going to be the best when I walked in, in anywhere but at the end of the day when you walk away from something that you don't necessarily you know do your best in you have to be able to ask yourself those hard questions and yes. stay humble in defeat to be able to go back to the drawing board dive back into you know being present keeping perspective uh to be able to make those changes moving forward so you know that that was very well said i almost like i almost don't want to add too much more to that i think that's something that <laughs> people can have a lot of takeaways from um there was one point that I that I jumped over only because the segue was much better into vulnerability. But I think this overarching concept of mindfulness and being present along the way, this is something that you know, when I run 
any type of athletic training or workshops or uh, coaching certifications is something that is so integral to Project Pure Athlete. It's really the um, ability to and the, the necessity to stay present and mindful in everything you do largely because you want to be able to take away those little puzzle pieces for that large, uh, powerful image. So for you, how do you keep yourself present and mindful when you're in a training session? What are some of the things that, um, that obviously you spoke a lot about a lot of things, but what are some of the things you work on? So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this with, there's two movies that I think everybody needs to watch and they're, they're drastically different, but the, the outcome uh, kind of really deals with this, this mindfulness and this, this, this kind of being present in the moment. The first one is going to be Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Love it. Um, in, in Kung Fu Panda, you know, uh, uh, the panda is played by Jack Black and he's talking to his, his teacher, his tutor, uh, Master Ugwe. And uh, he's talking to him and, you know, before, before uh, he, he passes on, um, he tells Jack Black, yesterday is history, uh, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, when I heard that for the first time, that like really like, it You're really stuck with me. It's like, yeah. you know, yesterday, yesterday is gone. Like there's nothing you can do about yesterday. Tomorrow hasn't happened yet. So like you really have no control over that, but you, all you have right now is right now. Uh, like there's nothing I can do yesterday to become a better athlete because it's already gone. There's nothing I can do tomorrow to become a better athlete because it hasn't happened yet. The only thing that I can do right now is what I have right now. So it's like really, it, it takes a lot of mental to kind of really focus in on that and really like focus your, you know, awareness to the present. And the second movie I would say is it's called Peaceful Warrior, and it's an adaptation off of a book called The Way of the Peaceful The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. Um, unfortunately, I have not read the book, but I have seen the movie probably too many times. Um, and it's it's really about focusing on the now, focusing on on you know um, being aware. So a lot of times, how that manifests for me in training is before going to training. And, and it can be any training session. It can be a very simple, you know, doing metabolic circuits. It can be high intensity plyometrics. It can be a max day, you know, all out. I, I really kind of just, you know, sit and I, I try to give myself five minutes um, and really just get my mindset ready. Kind of like in in the way of the, in the Peaceful Warrior, they talk about taking out the trash and it's it's the mental trash of like everything else that, you know, everything that has happened and everything that will be. So it's like really trying to like free my mind. Um, I will add a bonus movie, uh, The Matrix, because I know Morpheus talks a lot about like, you know, clearing the mind. Um, and he, and he says that before he takes the jump. He's like, you have to let it all go, Neo. Fear, doubt, disbelief, free your mind. So like when I'm going into a session, um, I try to let go of anything. So like, um, we, we are new dads. Uh, you know, there's, there's X, Y, and Z I have to do for my son there. You know, I just got a new job. I'm working, worried about like, did I get this paperwork in? Did I do this? Um, uh, I'm, I'm a new head coach of a track and field program and I'm really excited about that. So it's like, I have all these things that are going on in my head at all times. Like everybody else, we have these, we have these, you know, internal and external stresses. So like, I'll go in the gym, uh, or before I even get in the gym, I'm sitting in the car, I have to find, you know, the right song, you know, find a song and it's just like clear, like I have to like actively, it's almost an exercise. I have to actively let go of everything. And it's like, all right, all that matters right now is the right now. Like I can, you know, and it's, it's almost, you know, it's, it's almost, it's not even almost, it's very selfish of like, I'm letting go of all of the, you know, son, wife, family, like, I won't say drama, but things that I need to do, I need to let go of, you know, and it's like, all right, you can, you can pick this up, leave this in here and pick it up right when you're done with this session. But this, this session is the most important thing right now, because this is all you have. Um, and I'll just clear my mind, go in, hit what I need to hit, stay locked in. And then 
as things start to kind of come back in, like there's times where I have to like actively like try to refocus myself. But if I get to a point where it's, you know, the clutter is kind of coming in, that's like typically my cue, like, all right, you're done because you're not, you're not in the, you're not in the present. You're not focused on this. So this is not the, the focus. Let's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll shut it down and we'll come back and regroup it other day. And honestly, when I do that, that really helps me focus on the things that I need to focus on when, you know, when I'm with my family, because I don't have to worry about the workout because it's done. I did it. You know, it's in the past. I don't have to worry about the next one. It's, you know, it's, it's in the present. It hasn't happened yet. So it doesn't matter. And then I, I'm really focusing on every moment and making that moment important. And that hopefully, and, and, and what I try to do with my dunk, my dunk training as well is like focus on that where it's like, this is the most important dunk of my career because it's the only one I have right now. So when I get to contest, it's like, I'm ready for it because I am focused on that one dunk at that time. That's, that's great, man. That's such a, a powerful way to look at things. I think if anything, we got a really great list of movie references here that we can go through and, and uh, people can go and, and have some fun. After. I love Kung Fu Panda as well. Um, I will say that I think it, you know, mindfulness transcends all elements of being an athlete. You know, for me, I spent a lot of time in the gym with athletes and something as simple as just in a moment in an exercise and being present of small things like, you know, if you're squatting, you're present, you can feel the contact of the ground with your feet. You feel the bar on your back. You feel the tension you create through your body to be able to support things. And I think spending more time trying to find those little moments makes it easier to yeah. do um, the larger mindfulness practices that you talked about because not everybody will be able to do this right away. And I think it's important to understand that it's something that can be learned and something that is learned. You know, I think yeah. there are a handful of people that it might come easier to. Um, but if you try, you know, mindfulness practice, some of the stuff John's talking about, uh, don't, don't be upset. You have to let yourself off the hook if it's difficult and try again. Because at the end of the day, all we are is a byproduct of the amount of persistence we can really put into any given effort um, while maintaining that perspective. And, uh, you know, I'd like to say being vulnerable and, human and, and, and humble at the same time as well. So I, I love, I think we did a really good job of breaking down some of these really key elements of the elite mindset. I'm super excited, John, to see your progress now as part of Team PPA. Um, I want to make sure everybody that is listening to this is also following along with your uh, process as well. Where can people find you um, on social media? Where should people go looking for Jay Clark the Jumper? Definitely. Um, uh, Jay Clark the Jumper. So if you look at, um, I think I've done a pretty good job of, of kind of, you know, claiming all of the social media accounts. So Twitter. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, all J Clark, at J Clark the Jumper. Um, and you should be able to find me um, there and just, yeah, definitely check, check out the journey. Tyler and I have talked. Uh, Tyler, Chase have talked. I, myself and Chase have talked. And, and we're, we're kind of really, you know, focusing in and lasering in on this, uh, this do the impossible journey. And I, I think, um, it's, it's always cool to kind of have documents of things as I'm processing through it. And I think this is going to be something like even myself, I would love to like look back and listen to myself, talk about this process before it's actually happened. Um, because I, I'm 100% confident, you know, under team PPA, we're going to get this, we're going to get this done and, and uh, we're going to, we're going to make uh, history. So I, I'm excited. Just tune in and, and follow the journey. We're stoked, man. We can't wait to be, you know, a, a, that small part of your journey. We'll do anything we can. You know that from our end to make sure that that happens. Uh, and more importantly, we're there as a support team for you as well. I think it's important that you have really good, strong um, uh, supportive people in your corner. And you have that with us always. Um, because we know you support us as well. Absolutely. Really appreciate you again, John, taking your time to be with us today. Talk mindset. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. 
for those listening, thank you for being here. Make sure if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're looking at our beautiful faces, you hit that like button, make sure you subscribe. We're going to be jumping into more podcasts down the road. I know John will be back on before we know it. If you're listening to this on, on iTunes, then make sure you uh, give this a five-star rating. It really helps the podcast move in the right direction. Do anything you can to help us share this message. We're here for the athletes. We're here for you. John, thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for having me. We'll catch you guys soon. Bye.